Hello everyone, welcome to Respectful Dave. Today we will be playing a game and I will analyze, I will talk about what my thoughts are during the game so you can learn. Let's go. Okay, so we have a game. We're going to open with d4 occupying this four central squares. Knight f6. We're going to develop our pieces. I'm going to play knight c3. d5. My opponent is doing the same. And I'm going to play this move, bishop f4. The Jabava London. This is what we call it. This is what we call theory in chess. So every single move or every single move in the first five moves of the chess game have a, a name because it's been played before. So in this case, I'm going to play the Jabava London. My opponent plays c6 and I'm going to play f3. Why are you playing f3? Well, I'm planifying. I want to play e4, but e4 in the other move would have lost the pawn because black has one, two pieces covering uh, e4 and I only have one. So I want to play e4 in a better version so I can take back and not lose a pawn. My opponent is thinking, and in the meantime, you would think, oh, I'm just going to relax. But no, of course not. You don't, you shouldn't relax. You should start thinking about what you're going to do next. In this position, I'm going to play e4. This is my plan. Sometimes your opponent avoids what you want to do. Sometimes your opponent doesn't. In this case, I think my opponent did a right thing, which is just continued development in a normal way. And now I think, well, I want to castle short side. So I want to move this bishop. The question is, should I move it to e2? Should I move it to d3? Should I move it to c4? Which one's the best? If I move it to c4, for example, I think bishop g4 might be a little bit annoying. Hmm. So I'm thinking, well, maybe bishop e2 is a little bit more solid. I'll play bishop e2. Now, if bishop g4, I can play something like h3 or castles. And bishop takes f3 is not winning the pawn on d4. So I'm going to castle. You should always castle as soon as possible in the opening. If you don't castle, it's very likely you're going to get checkmated. I'm going to play h3. Bishop takes. Bishop takes. And now I have something called the bishop pair. You might, you may have, sorry, you may have heard of the bishop pair before. David, what is the bishop pair? The bishop pair is when you have two bishops. In fact, you both have two bishops at the beginning of the game, but the bishop pair you say you have the bishop here once you're the only one with the two bishops. Does black have two bishops? Of course not. We saw that black gave up a bishop for a knight. And now I have the bishop here. Bishop pairs are very good in open positions. And this is pretty open. So I'm happy with my position. I'm going to continue to develop my pieces. So my rook goes to the d1 square. And this is what we call the middle game. We're done with the opening. We've both occupied the center. We've both developed our knights and bishops. And we've both castled. So now we're in the middle game. Which means that we have to treat this treat the whole uh rules of the game in a different way so now we don't want to castle we've done it already now our main priority may not be occupying the center anymore like in the opening now in this case for example in my main priority might be launching a kingside attack of course in chess you would like to attack but before you attack you have to make sure that your pieces are in active squares if not your attack won't work so my opponent played queen a5 now other thing you have to take into account while playing a game or, or trying to planify things is something called motives. Motives are little tactics that repeat themselves during the chess games and your chess games. And there will always be a, uh, around. So for example, a motive is with this queen on a5, I have an idea of playing something like knight d5, queen takes d2, and taking on f6 first. Now, unfortunately, knight, the knight on f6 is protected by both the knight and the bishop. But if it wasn't, then I would take this knight first with check, and then I would win an extra knight. So I have to be aware of those things. It might not happen in this game, but it's just an example of the motives that could appear. Now, queen a5, I guess my opponent wants to play rook d8. I'm asking myself, what does my opponent want to do? That's very important. Um, and I, I'm, I'm thinking, well, maybe... Maybe I want to keep the queens over the board. That's another question you should ask yourself. Which pieces should I trade? My opponent also wants e5 probably. So I'm going to play e5 myself. Now, I am aware that knight d5 is there. But I have an idea. And just sometimes the position, or not sometimes, in fact, all the time, the position is transforming. All the time, all the time. So from one move to another, the position, you might have to treat, you might have to think of the position in a totally different way to what you were doing before. So, for example, I was talking about the motive of the queen on a5. That might not be around anymore because we might have to trade queens. Or, let's say, the bishop pair. I might not have the advantage of the bishop pair, 
because I might trade my bishop for the knight after the knight jumps to d5. I changed my mind, or in fact, it's not changing my mind. Sorry, my mind. The position is changing and I am adapting to it. So after knight d5, one continuation is bishop takes d5, c takes d5, and bishop h6, where I don't have the bishop pair anymore, but I have a little bit of a kingside attack because black's pieces are a little bit um, in uncoordinated. Okay, now my other option is to play this, knight takes d5, queen takes d2, and play what we call, this is, this would be an endgame. So I might do that. In fact, I'm going to play the endgame. Because I think bishop takes is one way of approaching this position, and I would be fine after something like bishop h6. But I think the endgame would be nice with two, with both of my bishops. I think we can demonstrate an advantage. Now, bishops need open diagonals or, or, or open positions in general. So I'm going to open up the position with c4. I think that's what my bishops want to do. So with this, everything's very concentrated into what my, my pieces want. So my, my pieces want open diagonals. I'm going to give them that. My pieces want open files. I'm going to give them that with rook c1. And I'm doing pretty well. Um... Upon his thinking, we're down to 30 seconds, so we might we might start getting to dangerous zones. Dangerous zone. I take this pawn, I play bishop c6. This knight is under attack. And I thought here I was winning with bishop a5. Now this is tactics. Ah, I see. Knight b6 protects the, the rook, so I don't win this exchange. The rook, if the rook had moved, I would have taken. But yeah, knight b6. I'm going to play bishop e4. This bishop is pretty doing pretty well, but still not as easy as I thought. But this knight is still pinned, so that's good. I'm going to develop my, or I should, I should say, I'm going to improve my king's position. Like rook d2, protecting this pawn. And we should be okay. We play quickly enough. Hmm. I'm going to keep the bishop there, because it's very strong. I'm going to try to play... Something like rook e1, maybe. Rook c2. Now my opponent forces me to exchange. Which is fine. I'm going to try to get my rook to c2 to contest the c file. I'm going to have to play this. I have no other ways to keep being in this c file other than that. And I'm going to push for d5. I think my opponent is letting me get a little bit active, which is good for me, of course. And I think I have e6 in this position. It's getting a little bit dangerous for black. I take back. I take with the rook. Now I'm threatening a discovered check. King g3. My king is pretty active, which is good. Rook g6 is a big threat. And against that, I think I win a pawn. And now h7 is also weak. I'm going to play bishop. I'll check first, then I'll play bishop f3. I want to cut this king from the action. That might be helpful. I'm going to take this other pawn. And I'm going to put my king on g4. It looks a little bit scary. And chess can be scary, of course. But um, my king is more active than, than in danger. That's how I evaluate that position. I'm going to play that. I'm going to play h4 now. H, g is a big threat. Yeah. Now I think I can... Play hmm, hg. It's, it's a little bit complicated. A little bit. I have two pawns, so I should be able to win this. It, it is what we call uh, an opposite color bishop endgame, which famously uh, they're famously known to be difficult to win. But not impossible. And now, my opponent, I think, blundered, because now I get this. And it's still complicated, but now a rook endgame is more likely to be uh, winning in this position. So I'm just going to advance both of my pawns. I'm going to keep this rook defending this pawn. And hopefully I can start bringing my pieces to more active squares, little by little. And this is what many people don't understand. So in chess, sometimes you get a winning position and 
and that doesn't mean you're going to win soon. Um, that just means that you're in a winning position and you will win eventually. That might be... Uh, sorry, I, I just considered. That might be in one move or that might be in, 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 in 20 moves, even more. So it's all about trying to, to demonstrate an advantage and going little by little, little rather than, oh, I'm winning, I should be winning uh, soon. That, that's not the way it is. And there's this famous quote by Grandmasters that goes, Grandmasters don't care about winning immediately. They just care. They just want to win. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't have to take two moves. It, it, if it takes 90 moves, that's fine for them. So now I'm going to play rook f8. Now rook takes, I play rook f7. And if not, then I'm winning anyway. So good game. Um, I think we, we learned that in this position, after e5, we get to this very comfortable endgame. Although I must admit that it got a little bit out of control after this bishop c6. And the reason why it got out of control is because black got activity. So do you remember this position? In this position, my pieces are very active. So black's pieces are a little bit more passive. But after I got into this, um, let's say, chaos <laughs> over the board, I think I let black get a lot of activity with this knight b6 move which I missed. And that happens. So you, sometimes you miss your, 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 your opponent's resources and that's it. In this position, I brought my king. I played rook d2. I was resisting. I was holding here. I kept. I tried keeping my bishop here, but my opponent very, very cleverly forced me to trade one of my bishops for the knight. So I cannot go anywhere else. Everything else is protected. So I have to take this. And now this is an equal endgame. This should be a draw. But as I said, I think my opponent let me get some activity with Pawn to d5, um, bishop rook takes d5, and e6 is a little bit of a scary move to meet. Even more so after rook takes e6, you don't know if you should go to f8, to g7. And if you go to g7, there's a check. If you go to f8, there's a check. A little bit difficult to meet this in, a, in time trouble. But we kept our cool. We took this, and eventually we took another pawn. And after a couple more moves, we managed to trick a little bit our opponent so in this position if black keeps these two minor pieces it might be a draw it might be more complicated for white to win because there are more pieces over the board but if white sorry if black lets me exchange the bishops now i'm instantly winning and that follows the principle we were talking about before which is if you're winning you would like to trade pieces and if you're losing you would like to keep pieces over the board I think that would be it for today. Thank you very much. Please let me know if you have any questions and thank you for watching. Have a nice day.